Happy Friday, interwebs, and welcome to WatchGuard Security Week in Review, a video podcast dedicated to quickly summarizing the biggest information and network security stories each week and to sharing practical security tips along the way. I'm your host and security geek, Corey Nockreiner, and this is the episode for the week starting March 2nd, 2015. Let's go ahead and jump right into the daily security bites. With one exception, I've left out Thursday's episode where I review CSI Cyber. While it was a fun episode, it's longer than normal and serves no practical purpose purpose. So I'll leave it up to you whether or not you want to watch it. That said, I will put it all the way at the end of this episode if you're interested. With that said, let's move on to the Daily Bytes. Today's story is an update on fraudulent TurboTax filings. You probably remember a few weeks back when I mentioned that customers were seeing an increase in false or fraudulent tax filings that seemed to come from TurboTax. Essentially, bad guys either hijacked your TurboTax account or filed one for you and would then file your taxes and thus get your return. For a time period, TurboTax actually turned off state filings to figure out what was going on. Well, just this week, Krebs on Security posted a screen where two X Intuit employees have said that uh, TurboTax is not doing as much as it can to protect you against this fraud. Essentially, they said there's many techniques TurboTax can use to identify this fraud, but doing so could affect their bottom line. They make money for tax filings, whether it's a criminal or you doing the filing. And they suggest that if they, they did more to stop this fraud, the fraudsters will just go to some other tax filing company out there. Now these are just allegations and in a blog post Intuit basically says this is malarkey. They do as much as they can to protect customers. They're the number one reporter of tax fraud to the IRS and other things like that. So I just thought this was an interesting story. But whether you believe the whistleblowers are Intuit, one thing remains true. That is bad guys are targeting online tax filing systems. So if you're in the US and you're filing your taxes, some simple tips are first, use a very, very strong password. It should be 14 characters or, or higher. It should be random and not something you use anywhere else. More importantly, as I mentioned before, try to file your taxes as quick as you can. It really is a simple tip, but if you file for your social security number, uh, an attacker can't file for you. So if you file early, you may protect yourself. Today, I freak out about yet another SSL vulnerability. Seriously though, freak is the name given to a new flaw in SSL, which of course is one of the encryption mechanisms we use for network communication, primarily for connecting to secure websites. Today, researchers released a new flaw in SSL. Basically, the flaw has to do with SSL implementations that still use the RSA export cipher suite. So a quick history lesson. Back in the day, the US used to outlaw the export of really strong cryptography. We wouldn't share strong encryption with certain governments that uh, we didn't agree with. That's long since gone, but apparently some SSL implementations still use this weaker RSA export cipher suite, specifically iOS products, Apple OS X products, and Google Android products still use this suite. So what's the big deal? Well, basically, if a bad guy can pull off a man-in-the-middle attack, get in between you and your secure web traffic, he can force you to use this weak encryption suite, which allows him to crack it and thus see your decrypted traffic. Now, cracking it will take a little bit of time and money, but this is a weak enough cipher that is pretty easily done nowadays. So the real-world impact of this is quite mixed. Now, I think if you're on a static network, it's pretty hard for a cyber criminal to get in between you and normal traffic. They have to either do DNS cache poisoning or hijack your computer. On the flip side, on public wireless networks, this becomes a much bigger deal. It's pretty easy for other wireless people to kind of intercept your traffic and pull off this sort of man in the middle attack. And then there's even nation state connotations. Apparently, according to the Snowden leaks, it's relatively easy for our governments to actually intercept traffic as we're sending it over the internet. So this is probably a pretty easy attack for nation states to pull off. In any case, it's being fixed. If you're an Apple or Google user, they promise updates soon, and there are fixed versions of OpenSSL too. So just be aware of this freak vulnerability and make sure your products are up to date. Today I'm talking about Gazon, a new piece of Android malware. 
Adaptive Mobile, a security company, discovered a new SMS-based Android worm. It spreads by sending text messages talking about free Amazon gift cards. If you click the shortened link in this message, it's going to try to get you to download a APK or Android installer file, which of course infects you with this malware. If you run the program, it keeps trying to get you to download other things and fill out surveys, all the while you're making money for the attacker. Meanwhile, behind the scenes, it's stealing all your contacts and sending SMS SMS messages to them as well. Apparently this was pretty effective. It's actually sent hundreds of thousands of spam messages and infected at least 4,000 US-based Android users. The good news is the good guys have actually gotten the servers associated with this malware turned off, but I do expect more malware like this in the future. But as Android users, you can protect yourself. First, you should run some sort of mobile security product. Many can detect Android malware before you download it. On top of that, you should turn off the side-loading capabilities of your Android device. Only download software from the official Google Play market. It sometimes has malware, but it's much safer than third-party markets. Finally, if you're a WatchGuard customer, APT Blocker might help. APT Blocker can actually detect APK-based malware as well. So if you download something on your mobile device while it's behind a WatchGuard firewall, we might be able to block this. Today, I need to give you an update on the Freak SSL vulnerability. You probably remember on Tuesday how I described this SSL flaw where certain implementations use a weakened export cipher and basically a man-in-the-middle attacker can force you to use this cipher which might allow them to decrypt your SSL traffic. At the time the researchers that disclosed this said that it mostly affected Apple iOS and OS 10 devices and Google Android devices. However later in the week Microsoft posted a security advisory saying Windows was vulnerable too. They use S channel for SSL and it still has this weakened uh, export cipher suite. Now Microsoft does not have a patch for this yet, but they do offer some workaround options. For instance, if you use group policy, you can use it to push a cipher list to all your servers that excludes this particular weakened cipher. You should check out Microsoft's security advisory to see how to do that. Meanwhile, WatchGuard customers may want to know if we're vulnerable to this particular flaw. And the good news is, for the most part, we are not. Though some of our products do use a version of OpenSSL that ships with this particular weakened cipher suite. The good news is WatchGuard excludes this suite by default. That means our XCS appliances are not vulnerable, our XTM appliances, even the E-series appliances are not vulnerable, wireless access points are not vulnerable, Dimension is not vulnerable, but the one exception is if you have a SSL VPN appliance, the 100 or the 560, it does still contain this particular export cipher suite. We do plan a software update for it that will fix it in the future, but keep an eye out for that. That's it for this week's InfoSec news, but there were other stories, so if you're interested, be sure to go to blog.watchguard.com or watchguardsecuritycenter.com. There, you can find the blog post associated with this video, and there's a reference section with many other links you might be interested in. On top of that, you can follow me on Twitter, I'm at SecAdept, or you can follow WatchGuard at WatchGuardTech, and finally, be sure to subscribe to the YouTube channel if you want the videos immediately. Thank you for watching, and here at WatchGuard, we're rooting for you. Welcome to WatchGuard's Daily Security Byte. I'm your host, Corey Nockreiner. Today, I'm keeping it light with my review of CSI Cyber. If you're in the US, you might have noticed last night, CSI Cyber premiered. And this, of course, is the spin-off of Crime Scene Investigation, or CSI, that concentrates on information and network security. And to be honest, as an information security professional, I'm kind of excited whenever my industry gets more mass appeal and public attention. So movies like Black Hat in CSI Cyber are kind of exciting ideas to me. On the flip side, I was never really expecting much from CSI Cyber. In any case, if you want my really quick unfiltered review, here it is. Oh my god. Seriously though, the show's not that good, I don't recommend it. Well, it does have seeds of truth, you know, you can tell there's researchers that have tried to look into to some real-world cyber incidents. It doesn't ring authentic, you know, the bad guy's motivations are off, it's way too melodramatic. So let's start with just the premise of this show. Essentially, a uh, bad guy has hijacked a webcam in a baby's room. This really comes out of the headlines, you know, these IP-based webcams, as I've talked about in this, this podcast, 
podcast, are vulnerable to attacks. And there was an incident where pranksters were yelling at a baby. But in this case, the motivation of the attackers using this technique were to kidnap babies and to sell them off to the highest bidder. That's not what webcam attacks are going to be used for. You know, most people that are going after webcams are pranksters joking around and or people that are actually doing something gross, trying to catch people in, in confidential or sensitive moments. So I, I, the whole idea of people getting killed and kidnapping babies because of unsecured webcams is really taking the FUD or the fear, uncertainty, doubt, and paranoia way too far. You know, I, I'll give them credit for trying to use the right terms. They talk about rats as remote access Trojans, and yet the way they actually use the term throughout the show becomes kind of uh, inauthentic. It's not the way real experts would use it. Granted, I do know to make this entertainment, you need to make it more interesting. You know, real hacking can be boring. If I'm an analyst trying to find out if something's malware and I'm doing a, a black box analysis using an assembler, the type of stuff I'm looking at is pretty boring. So I get where sometimes they'll have to show fancy source code that's colored differently to make it look exciting to the, the non-technical viewer. On the flip side, what I don't like is them giving the general consumer the wrong idea about the level of severity for different threats. Webcam vulnerabilities are a big deal, and you probably should be slightly aware of them for your privacy, but they won't result in kidnapped babies. There are probably cyber attacks that can have physical repercussions, but I'm beginning to think this show is probably going to show every single cyber attack turning into death. I could vent on and on about how I don't like how cliche this show is, how it uses the overweight bearded white hat hacker, the hair colored trendy nerdy hacker, and the, the bad guy trying to go good hacker. But really, it's, it's not worth it. When it comes down to it, even if all the cyber security is bad, if the show is at least entertaining, that would be fun. But honestly, I found this way too over melodramatic, bad acting, bad writing, and I'm just a little disappointed. But the biggest problem, again, is the fact that people watching this show, if they think this is the reality of cyber attacks, the real threat that they have to worry about, that's too bad. What this show showed does not reflect reality at all, and yet there are some very dangerous threats out there that could result in you having financial losses and privacy losses that would have an impact on your life. It's too bad they didn't show those type of attacks, at least not in this particular show. Now, while I'm talking about cybersecurity and pop culture, if you do want to see a show that has great portrayals of some of the threat actors out there, I actually recommend you check out House of Cards. House of Cards is not a show about information security. It's about uh, political intrigue and corruption. And yet they have a big thread on a particular cyber attacker. In fact, a previous black hat that's been forced or coerced into working for the FBI. And I actually find the subtle nuance to this particular character and some of the techniques he used, like most recently in the season three, using social engineering to actually get information, as much more true to life to what information security and, and malicious attackers are all about. So if you want a better portrayal of cybersecurity on TV, or at least on Netflix, check out House of Cards. Anyways, no real practical advice in this particular video post, other than maybe if you want to save an hour of your life, I recommend you avoid CSI Cyber. That's it for today. Thanks for watching.